When I think of design, I think of, that's a really hard question. When you try to brush your teeth, if your toothbrush wasn't designed properly, it wouldn't work. If your chair didn't function, you would fall on the floor. If your doorway wasn't the proper size, you would bump into the wall. It's a space that you're in, an object that you're using. Design brings joy to people. When you hold a fork that's well designed, it makes you really happy, or the way a glass hits your lips. You might not know why you feel happiness, but it's because things are designed. It's creating relationships between people and the built environment. It's everywhere, it permeates everything. It is literally one of the most powerful tools in society. But I believe that design needs to be more accountable. And it needs to be more responsible. And that first starts with us understanding what design actually means. The assumption has been if we just design for the average human being, we're going to hit the broadest possible market. And the impact of that is that we've developed an entire generation of solutions that meet the needs of some, but not all. You're going to take your life experiences and apply them to the situation at hand. You know, what great designers do is they're able to sort of look at and find those common touch points that large groups of people are experiencing and figure out how to design something that's going to work for all of them. It's about creating a diversity of ways for people to participate in an experience with a shared sense of belonging. And the most important piece is that it is designed with or designed by someone who's experienced a high degree of exclusion. Hey, comma. It looks like I won't be able to make the 2.30. About eight and a half years ago, I was working my first job in New York City, and I noticed that I couldn't type as well. I thought maybe it's carpal tunnel at a young age, or, you know, I slept on my hand or something. They rushed me over to the neurologist, waited some time, and they noticed that other fingers were starting not to work, and then a shoulder, and then another shoulder, and another hand, until about three to four years ago, I became fully paralyzed in my hands and arms. They think that the motor neurons that control the muscles are dying, and they don't know why. Because I was losing control of my body and I didn't know what was gonna happen, if it was gonna go to my legs or it was gonna go to my breathing, I tried to control other things in my life, like relationships and work. And I didn't really realize that until friends started to say, like, this is manifesting in other ways. And that's when I realized that you can show pain not just in tears, you can show in actions in other ways. In my apartment that I've hacked, I don't feel disabled in it because everything works for me. So yes, the medical definition is that I have a disability. But when it comes to the social definition, I believe that these products are disabling me. And I say that because the only time I really think about my disability is when I'm challenged with a product that I can't use. And then I hack it and then I can use it. Even though I was living by myself and my arms didn't work, I was able to figure out a way to feed myself. I was able to figure out a way to type. But one of the big things in the winter is that I have to stay bundled up. So I needed a coat that I could slide on easily myself. My hands were becoming purple because I had nothing to cover my arms when I went out and I was getting sick. So I was referred to Grace. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Grace Jun. I am the executive director at Open Style Lab. Open Style Lab aims to make style accessible for people of all abilities, regardless of cognitive or physical disability. We bring engineers, occupational or physical therapists, and designers together to collaborate with people with disabilities to co-create anything that is related to style. So it could mean wearable tech devices to accessible garments, but they're doing it together. We were able to make Christina a coat with boning to cross the neck so she could bite onto the boning and flip the coat over her head. And most importantly, the sleeves were kind of like these sacks where she could rest her arms. It was also two-piece, so there was a dress component, but she could also wear the coat whenever she wanted to outside. Open Style Lab opened up my creativity and being able to make this change with them was so important to my happiness. So really, you know, giving me that gift is one of the best gifts I've ever gotten in my life. Da -da -da. <laughs> <laughs> Since I met Christina, it just kind of took off. Not only did I see her as a collaborator, but she became one of my best friends. The friendship and admiration just grows, and she became a bridesmaid in my wedding that happened most recently. For my wedding, I wanted to be able to hold the bouquet. So I spent probably the first three hours in the morning as a bridesmaid trying to figure out how to make this bouquet stay. <laughs> we need to figure out like a weight balance with this flowery thing and clear bra straps that we need to put together in three hours. So we hacked it on the fly, it worked, and then it easily snapped off and I was like, good job done. Now we can go celebrate and get some drinks and <laughs> congratulate you. <laughs> Oh, there is conductivity. Since I met Christina, you know, we've ideated so many different ways of looking at clothes and assistive technologies together. Do you want it for both toes or just one toe? Uh, I think just one for now because I, I type with one. Yeah. And we always have side projects. And frankly, I wouldn't have it any other way. All right. Let's clone them. Perfect. Let's see. Uh huh, it works. Yay. Yay. Okay. All right, so this material is good. <laughs> it was a dream of ours to have a board member with a disability that opened Style Lab to make it as diverse and inclusive as possible. Christina seemed to have the passion, she had the drive, so she's like, let me do it. And I was like, okay. So I guess we could discuss about reviewing for summer, right? Five weeks that so we'll have our final show on Friday. I wasn't a designer by trade before I started Open Style Lab, but now I'm a designer. Let's place that there. This year, we're working with girls that are in high school that are disabled, and I hope I do the same for those girls and show them that they can be designers. Five weeks. Let's see, one of them is kind of like. What's great about inclusive design is it says, you know, to do really great design, let's not design for people, let's design with people. You're bringing people in who maybe have a disability, maybe live their life a different way from how you as a designer live and who really know how to put into words and show us their personal experience. As designers or engineers or business leaders, every choice we're making is tipping towards either exclusion or inclusion. One of the ways to tip it towards inclusion is designing for and with people with disabilities. But there's many different ways to describe inclusion. It just means many different things to different people. For example, when we look at the design of how our cities come to be, Detroit is a fascinating city to take a closer look at. Detroit's a place where there's a pattern, a history, decades and generations of decision makers choosing to wipe out neighborhoods in order to build new housing developments that were perceived as maybe the next innovation in housing design. 
Families were disbanded. Communities were disbanded. People were relocated forcibly in many cases. These decisions are made often without engaging in a meaningful way with the communities that have lived there for generations, have built businesses, who are the economic heart of that city. And when we go back and we look at that cycle, we start to ask ourselves, well, where can I interrupt that cycle? You know, where are the decision points that I can start to tip it towards inclusion? About four years ago, I was here overseeing the demolition of the towers and the row houses. Whenever I'm out here, it does remind me of what happened with my old development. The public housing developments in Detroit are all the same with different names, pretty much. It's really interesting for me to watch construction and demolition just because I'm interested in it. But to have this personal tie to those spaces, it's a different feeling. A rare one because it's not often that someone from this type of neighborhood ends up in the profession that I'm in. I'll never forget the thing she told me when I first met her, which is that in the history of licensed architecture, only 400 architects have been female and African-American, 0.3%. This is important in context of where Tiffany grew up. As an elementary school student, this was where I used to walk to school, to the front door over here. Herman Elementary School is the school I attended as a kid. It's also part of the housing development where I grew up called Herman Garden. It was public housing for those of us who are low income to live. It was row houses, like there were a couple high rises where the senior citizens live. From the outside looking in, it was a pretty dangerous place because there were a lot of gangs, there were a lot of drugs. But to us, it was the community that we knew as home. I grew up here from kindergarten through fifth grade. My grandmother played a big part in my upbringing since my parents were very young. She's the oldest living member of our family, someone who I looked up to as very strong. And we all just adore her and the wisdom that she gives us. I always loved creative writing, always loved music. But art was completely wiped out in Detroit public schools. I remember wondering what I was supposed to be doing, wondering why I was in this environment, wondering why my classroom looked like this, wondering why my neighborhood looked like this. By the time I was 14, about half of Herman Gardens had been demolished. And they were just moving over to our section of the development. We didn't really have any choice but to leave. The plan for most people was to come back because before we moved out, we were told this bright, shiny new thing is gonna come back to this, this space. You are the people who will have the first opportunity to come back. But that kind of became a forgotten idea after 10 years went by. If I had complete autonomy of this site, it would definitely be a mixed use type of development. A place with lots of green spaces and parks for kids to play and, you know, everyone feels welcome. The architecture of it would still reflect the history of what Detroit is. There is no resurgence of our city if we are leaving our neighborhoods behind. So my focus is on our neighborhoods and our communities and the people who are there because they are the ones who make a city what it is.
I have always been interested in design and fashion. I learned how to sew when I was five. I would replace buttons on clothes that I didn't like. I always wanted my shoelaces to kind of match back to my outfits. I really loved how fashion was able to just really express my mood or my personality. Appearance is incredibly important. I think people assume that it's just superficial and that clothing is superficial. Clothing is a way to form self-expression and connectedness, but it's also a way that sometimes you become disconnected with the community. I'll see you guys later. Hi, Eleanor, how are you? Should we hang up your bag? So I have a daughter, Eleanor, right. who has autism. She was diagnosed at two and a half. She's 10 now. She still wears pull-ups and her cognitive ability is three, four, five. It's a little bit more scattered. When she was first diagnosed, I had talked to a gentleman and he gave me a piece of advice that at the time, sounded really shallow, but has shaped so much of how I approach things. He said, always make sure that your child is bathed, that she's in the most trend relevant clothing and that she has a haircut because it is the one thing that is going to make her less different than the others. It didn't make sense at the time, but over the years I've started to see how Clothing and self-care affects how people interact, not only with children, but with adults. I really began to understand just this incredible need with Eleanor. The earliest thing that we really needed was probably around the age of five, she would start to take off her diaper. And no matter what we did, we couldn't keep it on her. And so I was trying to find a onesie that was in a size five. And it was incredibly hard to find. And when I did find it, it was incredibly expensive. As Eleanor continued to grow, she's very tall for her age. I was trying to find clothes that would fit her body that was age appropriate, but developmentally appropriate. And that didn't really exist. Being a parent of a special needs child and a designer, I always look at function first. Like, how is this going to serve my family? How is this going to serve Eleanor? And then I think about aesthetics. And so I started thinking about creating my own brand. As I was doing this, I just realized that the price point that I would need to charge would be so much more than what people could afford. Because if you think about medical bills that we have, speech, OT, diapers, medications, et cetera, et cetera, spending $30 on a pair of leggings isn't always the first thing that you're going to think about. And then thinking about Target and this incredible platform that we have through Cat and Jack. It's really about celebrating children as they are, about their curiosity, their independence. We started to think about how could we use Cat and Jack a little bit differently. I connected with a couple of other designers that were having the same thoughts at the same time. And we just combined forces and created a business plan and presented it to leadership and said, 75 million people in the United States have disabilities. And that is a huge untapped market. They were so excited. We started developing samples. It was really important for us to connect with families. And we talked a lot about what do you wish existed? Or what hacks are you currently using? And so we interviewed upwards of 10,000 people. There's certainly not a lack of feedback or wants out there. We started a meetup group for parents of children with disabilities. And so Melissa was one of our members. Lead to us women. My name is Melissa Ampanza. I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I am a mom of two girls, a six-year-old and a four-year-old, Jada and Lucy. This one is hot, Mama. Ah! Mommy, it's fun. 
Lucy is a performer. Some colors. Look at mom. That's pretty cool. She loves drama and dance, and she's obsessed with princesses. Oh, look what Great. I did made. I see it. Wow. It's the, you know, new sassy, opinionated little girl that's coming out in our family for the first time. I had what seemed like a very normal pregnancy with Lucy. But when I went into labor, that's where things started to feel different. You know, Lucy was born and they did the very normal thing of bringing her up and, you know, laying her on my chest. And I just remember looking down at her and that was the first moment for me where I was like, well, this isn't like what it was like the first time. Her muscle tone was really poor. She's also profoundly deaf and wears cochlear implants. And then for a long, long, long time, she was not able to eat by mouth. And when Lucy was a baby, she was connected to a feeding tube basically 24 hours a day. And so having a tube that you're trying to snake through clothing with a child who only wants to wear tutus and princess dresses was always a big challenge. I was reaching out to try to connect with anyone else that was a working parent who was also dealing with a child at home that required just a little bit of extra care. And I met Stacy, who started to tell me about this vision, I just looked at her and I said, and how about we add clothing for kids that have G-tubes? And she looked back at me and she's like, that's really interesting, tell me more. <laughs> so she brought Lucy in one day and that was for the first time a lot of us had ever seen um, a feeding tube or how it actually works. But she was just very open and the team was really open and receptive and we we're like, okay, so how are we going to fix this? The thing about exclusion is these sometimes very small moments that accumulate over time, or there are these very large kind of clear signals that we are not welcome in that space. But we all experience exclusion in different ways in our lives. It's an experience that we can all relate to. Do you want to stop? No. That even scary. Oh, where are the bars? Monkey the bars. bars? The bars she used to climb. Yeah. Are they gone? <laughs> Bryn reminds me a lot of what I wished to be at her age. I'm winning. I'm winning. Bryn, <laughs> that's high enough. She's very confident, vocal, determined, strong. I'm not jumping. I was really shy and quiet. She's growing up very differently than I did. But as long as I can take my experiences and use them as tools to help Bryn and the next generation coming up behind me, then that's what I feel like my purpose is. People don't really realize the impact that space has on them. By the time I made it to college and learned about what the built environment meant. It made me think back to what was wrong with where I lived and where I learned in Herman Gardens. Bland walls, cheap material on the floor, learning spaces that did not encourage me to be creative even though I had that bone in my body. It told me that certain people didn't feel like I had opportunities to make something of myself. And it really made me think that, okay, um, that's not the case. I knew at that time that there was a greater world out there. And so I just kind of took the initiative to make sure that I didn't fall into that category. You don't see a lot of minorities in architecture. You don't see a lot of women in architecture without really knowing what the process is to become a licensed architect. I went into it blind. Tiffany Denise Brown. 
I was the only minority student studying architecture in my class who graduated. There were some times when I had instructors kind of telling me, maybe you should study something else. But I just kept telling myself that it had to be done. As a professional architect now on the other side of the table, I go back and try to be the face that I was looking for growing up and inspire the next generation to want to become architects or urban planners. Urban Arts Collective is a nonprofit that I started that offers innovative programming to teach kids about architecture and urban planning through art excellence. And so that means music, that means art, that means technology. There's three of us who started the initiative from Detroit. We've all ended up in the field of architecture. We all have a love of art and music and technology. And we started things off with hip hop architecture. I gotta ask, has anybody seen or heard of the camp? Just a couple of people? All right. So has anybody seen any of the music videos that we made? All right, so I wanted to try to make a black style of architecture. Every other culture has a style of architecture, right? So you think about Greeks, think about Romans. So I started with hip hop. A lot of people kind of discredit or discard hip hop. And our young yeah. people listen to it all day, every day. Yeah. And there are some skills that yeah. they have yeah. that are not recognized yeah. as design yeah. skills. So what I'm trying to do is extract these skills. If you could have one thing on your street that's not there right now, what would you have? I wish my neighborhood was more like lively, more upbeat, like didn't look so depressing. I got you. Yep. All right, go ahead, Jordan. Uh, less abandoned buildings and less liquor stores, probably. Okay, less liquor stores, and less abandoned buildings. So we're gonna take these ideas and we're gonna transfer them into a wrap. Okay. Design creates the community. It's what creates neighborhoods, but. There's a disconnect between designers and the public. One of the issues is we are not coming from the communities that we're designing for. There's very few black people and brown people who are designing spaces in their neighborhoods. Black and Latinx young people, they're going to make up 40% of the United States population, and yet they are dealing with a lot of systemic barriers that are impacting their ability to thrive. How do we give them the community, the access, the tools to design the world through their lens? We as designers are responsible for the life, safety, and welfare of the public. That's why we have to seek voices that otherwise are unheard and bring those people to the table to talk about what's needed in our living spaces. At the camera. Workshops, camps, that's how we can work together to create neighborhoods and communities. And then that cycle of exclusion stops. We certainly need to be educating children that design is an option for them and that they can actually shape how we live our lives. So we got everything? Okay. We got everything. When we design and when we test our solutions with someone who's experienced a high degree of exclusion, it really challenges us to think about the shape of that design, the ways that it can adapt to fit. That engagement and that conversation with someone who's experienced that exclusion uh, becomes a, a great source of creativity. So my name is Christina Mallon. Um, I was a co-creator like yourselves. Because of this experience, I really found where I belonged and was creating better experiences for people with disabilities like myself um, and you guys. This summer, we're going to be focusing on taking existing garments and hacking them. And we're also creating the actual tools they can use so that they can design different garments after they end with the program. Are you a designer as well? After today, you will be. Yeah.
<laughs> nice. You used a walker too, right? So we would want to design something that work doesn't get stuck in the walker. Long dresses always roll over my walker. And it's so annoying. Yeah. I always like to say I may be disabled, but my money is not, and I'm going to spend that money in places where I feel welcome. Do you like these wide open, or do you want something to hug your body more? What do you think? That looks pretty cool. Yeah. As the chief accessibility officer at the New York City Department of Transportation, I see the issues that come about when we don't design for a universal body. When we don't design subway stations, streets, intersections, or curb cuts, you know, a huge subset of the population is affected. So Open Style Lab just spoke to my heart. I like this together too. What is, is this for warm weather? Our six fellows really felt that they were ready for a lot of the different challenges that might come up. They did a lot of research on what might be good hacks, good designs, and just like different types of glues, adhesives, from pockets to Velcro to hooks that might be more approachable in terms of modifying and customizing your existing clothes. Um, so I'm thinking maybe because you want a dress, right? If we structure a dress to kind of be put on like a jacket, and then all you have to do is bring it around the front, that might be the easiest for you. Yes, girlfriend. Woo! That was awesome. I love that. We are working on identifying places to put loops or hooks or even Velcro. And eventually, we want to help the girls be able to hack their own clothing and customize where they want the loops and Velcros to be. So we have this tool called Simripper. This is like a com like commercially available Simripper, but for a lot of the girls, this is like hard to hold. So we have this in the foam, which is much easier to hold and like just better control in general to really see each of them manipulate the different tools that we gave them and seeing their ability and what we could help them do in the future was super cool. Are you tired now? I'm okay. You okay? Are you just saying that because you're being nice? <laughs> it's 4.30, you guys. So thanks for spending so much time with us. So for the girls, your assignment... The logo pitch is that Open Style Lab aims to make style accessible for people of all abilities but it's also creating a space for people to share about their different experiences. And where are there spaces where you can talk about it creatively instead of having to be institutionalized or being placed in a rehab home or being only for special schools? What I think Open Style Lab does is bring in community and we can hope that there is a bridge created, especially for the young, so they have earlier exposure, I think, to work more inclusively there is that ability for the designer to give the tools to the consumer and say, okay, create your own design. So there's a democratization happening where designers and consumers work together to create a product. I think it's still too long. You're a fancy girl, aren't you? Yeah, I always had you put makeup on. Why? Why do you want to put makeup on your face? It's already beautiful. Yeah, well. Because I like to. Lucy's very particular about what she wears. You always want to wear dresses. Mm -hmm. Why do you like dresses so much? Because I like to spin around. You like to spin? Yep. Meeting Lucy for the first time, she's just a typical little girl. And, and she was just curious. She was showing us her tube and she was just watching us and she had these really big brown curious eyes and she was just a child. And so how can you provide a solution so she can just be that? You know, we went in and we talked about how we live our life and I shared with them different ways that I had just been modifying clothing. And then from that initial meeting, they started to design some prototype clothing with abdomen access. Yeah, you, you can put opening. your hand in the hole and then when you put it in the hole, you, you can touch a tube. You can touch your tube. Right there. Right there. All right. <laughs> so Natalie had gone to Melissa's house and had worked with Lucy and started talking about what does Lucy need? What does Lucy want? 
We love to meet with our guests, so we love to pick their brains about what's popular. We want to know what the kids are doing and incorporate that into the artwork so that they see a little bit of themselves. We're going to make a horn. A horn? Oh. And you're going to do a... Oh, we've never done a buttercorn. Butter <laughs> I love your idea. I think we should do that. Sequins. <laughs> So yesterday I met with Lucy and we did some artwork together. She was super creative and had some wonderful ideas. I brought some of her drawings. Mm -hmm. So we have a buttercorn Ooh, I love that. <laughs> a new type of critter for us. Yes. Buttercorn. She also loves okay. rainbows. So um, she was very specific that she would like alternating flip sequin glitter, flip sequin glitter. And I think it's a really fun idea for a technique. Impressive. Yeah, I love right? It. You always want your child to have the option of being included and then they can choose whether or not they don't want to be included. But to be not included because it doesn't exist doesn't feel like a good option. It's not an option. So thinking about Halloween, thinking about inclusion, it can actually be a lot of anxiety for children that have autism or have physical disabilities. They want to show up and they want to participate, but there are these barriers. So we started working with the Halloween design team and we came up with some really fantastic ideas. So the shark. Looks like this was a fan favorite. Yes, and it's adorable. <laughs> we made it sensory friendly, so it's got no seams, it's tagless, so there isn't anything really to scratch the skin. And then um, all of the components are removable, so the hood can zip off, the tail can zip off, mm -hmm. so if someone's sitting in a wheelchair, they don't have to sit on the tail. Or if they're just really sensitive to things kind of flopping around, they can take them off. Um, and then also has a pocket on the front that hides an access for the tummy, so that was really well received, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, and the unicorn, I mean. It's truly the unicorn, right? It is, right? Yeah. Magical. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. How about hey, hey, hey. What is that? <laughs> it's a unicorn. There are a number of ways that being included in the design process, I think, improve it. But at the same time, I also think it's beneficial for kids like Lucy because they feel seen and heard and understood. And to have this group of people designing clothing for a whole lot of other kids that look exactly like you, it's just incredibly supportive. You just fall in love with people and the hearts of people who are involved in it. So I hope that I'll always stay connected to, you know, Stacy and others from the team that we're just such a part of the journey from the beginning. Eleanor is funny and kind and artistic and curious. She just kind of lights up a room when she comes in. Red. That is red. Red. Okay, put the top back on our blue. Mama, I done blue. I done blue. I know. Kiss. No, you don't like doing that. But if we don't put our top on, we will dry it out. I don't think anyone ever thinks they're going to have a special needs child because it's not widely talked about. You don't necessarily know the cues to look for. Thinking back to Eleanor, I think there were cues even when she was a newborn. Like she always needed to have some sort of pressure on her body. She hated her feet covered. We'd walk into like a store and she would just immediately start crying because it was just so loud. As she got older, we started to understand a little bit more, started to really look at her cues and look at the space around her and how could we set her up for success knowing what some of her triggers were. Eleanor goes to school at Sparrow Academy. She's been there for about a year and a half. It's a charter school specifically designed for children with special needs with autism. In this space, there's lots of natural light. The hallways are very large. 
There's couches, there's weighted blankets, there's a giant OT room where kids can go to focus on body movement and how to calm themselves. And so this school has just figured out how to connect with children and figure out how they learn and, and try different ways until they find something that clicks. Nice job. Nice. Can you pick up and pass to Imran? That's what I love about what we get to do. We get to make people's lives better, whether it's bringing them more joy, whether it's allowing them to do something more easily or to do something that they couldn't do prior. I mean, it all starts with talking about design talking about our humanity, talking about our emotions. I think that that's at the core of good design. Give me five, Bailey. Give me five, Brent. Go work hard, Brent. <laughs> Even though I've grown and gone off to college. I still live in Detroit, and my family still lives here. <laughs> Architecture has brought me to a lot of full circle moments in my life. One major one was when I ended up overseeing construction of the place where I once lived. It was a few years ago when I was working at a firm that was selected by the Housing Commission to oversee construction of the Garden View Estates, formerly Herman Gardens, the place where I grew up, the place where my grandmother raised all of her children. My office sent me out to lead that project. So I took a lot of pride in making sure the job was done correctly. It was very surreal just to be here again and see construction equipment here finally after it just sat vacant for so long. Finally, after 10 years, my grandmother moved back to Garden View Estates. I never thought I'd be living in a place where old Harmer Garden used to be, they called ghetto. Something that this baby had something to do with. I look at these places, they gorgeous. That's what she did. I can learn some things from her. <laughs> Don't get me started. Hey, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. I'm proud. I really am. Moments of significant change are critical points for practicing inclusive design. Whether it is choosing to tear down a neighborhood to build, you know, a new one. I'm not, I'm not on your bandwagon. Who we're engaging as designers in those solutions becomes so important because we have the opportunity to reshape some of these landscapes. Human beings need to have environments that are about socializing, that they feel connected to things. They need to have environments that they feel safe and comfortable. And I think that can translate into not just space, but translate into objects people interact with or you know, a series of different things that are designed that people feel like they're a part of something greater than themselves. 
said, so we need our helper letter. A helper letter. What's my helper letter? Uh, yeah. <laughs> my next letter is? I. Followed by D. Mm-hmm. E. Yes. S. A. 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 S. Within the last year and a half, Eleanor is a very different child. She has so much more confidence than she did before. You did it. She is a lot more verbal. We're getting more spontaneous conversation than we've ever had before. We're getting to see her as a person and what her preferences are, like what she thinks about, you know, what is funny to her. It's pretty amazing. We've waited 10 years to be able to, to do this. In Latin, Spiro means I hope, which I think is pretty profound given the population that we work with. The idea of inclusion in our school is pretty interesting. Most people, when they think about what inclusion means in an academic setting, it is taking both neurotypical and atypical students and joining them together so that they can learn from one another. But we've interpreted the word inclusion a little bit different. Inclusion to us is really creating an environment where children who have special needs, primarily autism, which is the focus of our school, can come to this school and feel a sense of belonging. When you walk into Spiro Academy and you see the students interacting the way that they are with their environment, they often don't really notice it. They don't really notice that Oh, there's a big window there. Oh, they can see trees or they can see birds outside. And maybe the staff don't realize it. Oh, they can actually see all the way down the hallway. They can see all of the students. As an individual, you just sort of accept the environment the way that it is, if it's done well. And a lot of thought goes into that. One of the features that I think is very unique are the calming rooms. When students become dysregulated, they often need a place to expend energy, they need a place to be alone. And the calming rooms is a place for them to do that. They have comfortable seating, very durable walls. It's really a place for the kids to bounce off the walls and do what they need to do, really express themselves. In the hallway, we have painted artwork that's on the ground, places where they can jump from place to place, just to kind of work out some of their energy. If they become regulated in that environment, they can come back into the classroom. So having those spaces makes it easier for the students to regain whatever control they need to gain without disrupting the broader school. I think that has been the, the greatest benefit of the building. Mm, that spells rice, rice, rice. Everybody's experience with autism is incredibly different, but sometimes there's similarity. So being able to connect with the network of people at Sparrow is a huge unlock because they can then talk about what it was that they were experiencing. We are gonna build together. So that you know how to do things differently if there was any trauma, or to replicate if there were successes. Oh. That solidarity really means a lot. It takes a village, it really does. Sometimes when you think about children with disabilities, they're cute, right? But then children grow up to be adults. They don't lose their disabilities. They're still very much out there, but we don't highlight them as much. How about alligator? Hey, you are an alligator. Another reason why I'm doing this is to have people understand what it's like. And again, it's just my story, but there's very similar stories with different variances, but there's all kind of that underlying theme. Our lives are just very different and they're messy and they're wonderful and they're different than what we expected, but better in some ways. And so how do more people have the courage to share that and make change and make difference. Because we're not gonna make any change or any difference unless we take that courageous first step.
Park Avenue. This is our final show, so today is the big day. And it'll be like a good culmination of like all the things we've worked on with the young teen girls. We're here to celebrate the hard work and collaboration of our teens, our fellows, the girls that we had the privilege of working with uh, for 10 weeks. Hi everyone, my name is Sudara Oleshi. Open Style Lab changed my life forever in learning how to sew, but it also taught me that anything is possible. For example, we shortened my dress because long dresses don't work with me and my walker. These girls have given me the freedom of doing what I love and exploring who I am. Thank you so much. Design allows people to say, this is me, this is what represents me. From there, people start to understand the importance of products and being able to express yourself as a human. Yeah, it's, it's, we're lucky to have you guys. It was really great work and definitely, I think, like leveled up from last year. Thanks guys, this was awesome. Sometimes I say to myself, my disabilities actually might be a blessing because I'm able to make a small change in the world by helping a lot of people with disabilities understand that they can do more than they think they can. I've watched our fellows go through the emotional journey from start to finish. When I asked them after the program, they're like, Grace, I really had no idea what I was gonna get myself into. I thought this was some volunteering thing where we kind of visit a couple of people with disabilities and little did I know, I met a friend or I got to meet someone that I knew closely. It doesn't always need to be a sob story. Like, do you need help? Can I help you? Uh, it, it shouldn't be that way, I think, because at one point we're all gonna need help. <laughs> and, um, how we approach that, I think, is just simply being considerate and listening and asking. So I think we're gonna look back at this point in time and say, you know, that's where design just fundamentally changed. That's where the lines between those who wore the hat of designer and people living their lives became further blurred. What's going to be interesting is who rises up as the future icons of design and what's their background? Where are they coming from? So the power of design is that it allows us to all be the creators. It allows for us to hold the power and to create a world through our image. And so when I think about design, joy, and possibility, I see all equal signs. Design equals possibility, and possibility equals joy.